Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let me begin with a correction from my previous lecture. I sincerely apologize for all this snafu, uh, but I made a calculational mistake, you see, and uh, you guys didn't correct me, unfortunately. So, so my error was the following. I, instead of writing, as I wrote during my email, instead of writing E star, I wrote E star, uh, e, star e, and then of course calculations uh, didn't check out. Uh, so now let me convince you one more time, this time correctly, uh, that uh, indeed this corollary holds as an immediate consequence of these above two lemmas. And by the above two lemmas, I mean, first and foremost, uh, this vanishing property uh, over here. And another thing which I have in mind is, of course, our basis lemma. Right? That, that I know that when I look at the absolute con uh, path algebra, this is my basis, okay? So up to linear span, which doesn't change anything, everything is linear. We are just looking of elements like chi, alpha, beta, star. So alpha is a path from uh, E and beta is a path from E. When they meet at the same vertex, they end at the same place. So it makes sense to, to write alpha, beta, star. This is one, this is alpha, and this is beta, star. Then this is a path. And that's all you can have, okay? There's nothing else because uh, this is a basis of the algebra. So now when you really want to see that uh, this corollary holds, basically instead of CKE, which is my vector space, my algebra, I just have to plug in a typical basis element and uh, see what happens. Uh, so let me do it. I just have to choose my pen to be a little bit thinner, but maybe not the red. How about the green? Okay, um, so you see a, a QV, all right, QV is written right here. And, and uh, uh, where to do this calculation, maybe here. Uh, so I have chi V minus sum, and here I have chi E E star. And what is very important is that the end of E star is exactly the beginning of E, which is V by, by definition of QV, okay? So, so when, I, when I multiply by any chi alpha beta star here, and now I have the same thing on that side, but now with a W, okay? So let me know, okay, maybe I'll write it. Chi uh, W minus the sum, and here you'll have these chi's, yeah, don't enough space. Um, uh, let's say sum over, so this is sum over E, and this is sum over F, and here I have chi F F star. Okay, and, and just as before, the end of F star is W. All right, so, uh, but even before you, you go into this, uh, you look, of course, uh, chi alpha beta star is the same as chi alpha and uh, times chi beta star. Right, this is by associativity in our algebra. And I keep writing with equivalence classes, okay? So I write this equation in the path algebra, but think about it that we do it uh, in this canonical quotient in the absolute path algebra. Uh, so you see uh, chi alpha, as long as alpha is a path of length bigger than zero, then chi alpha times QV is zero in the con algebra by, by the lemma 2.32. Likewise, uh, chi beta star, as long as beta is of length at least one um, by this uh, lemma, instead of uh, the other side, okay, uh, times QW is equal to zero. So the only way it can work is when alpha and beta are vertices. Of course, alpha and beta must be the same vertices, otherwise we'll multiply to zero. And uh, so we have like chi u times chi u, but chi u is an idempotent. So uh, here, instead of this general basis element, it suffices to put in chi u, all right? And now we are basically home and dry because uh, chi v chi u will give me Kronecker's delta between v and u. Uh, then of course, because this ends at uh, v as well, uh, chi, chi u times all that sum, every element of the sum will be given by the Kronecker's delta, all right? 
Uh, so so well, that thing can survive uh, if and only if uh, u is equal to v. And likewise, on the other side, uh, the other multiplication can survive if and only if uh, uh, u is equal to w. So at the end of the day, uh, you will just uh, end up with v being equal to w. So this is this Chronicles delta. And well, one of the things uh, which you can easily check that these QVs are quite important. And uh, then you have QV times QV, and this is QV again. So this really proves this lemma, this corollary. Okay, but maybe I should I should add uh, uh, here one more uh, lemma. I, I somehow forgot that it's uh, useful here, um, namely that 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 uh, QV idempotence, right? But that's this is very very simple uh, exercise. Okay, any questions about this part? Okay. Uh, if not, let's proceed uh, further. So I, I apologize again for this mistake I did last time and uh, exchanging the roles of VND star, which led to all this confusion uh, with characters to give a field and so on and so forth, which is completely irrelevant. This is just a very, very simple calculation, which I did. And uh, you basically bank on the fact that QV is I important. All right. So now um, I have to go back in time a little bit. Uh, because I want to write some more corollaries of the main theorem. And to this end, I have to remind you, oops, I, I'm wondering if I can just use search, control F, expanded graph. It's searching. In the meantime, I'll keep on scrolling. Maybe if I make it smaller, then scrolling will be faster. Oh, yes, I can scroll like this. So, somewhere at the beginning uh, of our lecture notes, uh, we defined the extended graph. I know that I already uh, explained to you what the extended graph is, but now I want to view it in, in a specific way. This is why I'm backtracking a little bit. It's somewhere at the very beginning. Yes. I have the opposite, yeah, you see, because I need this concept uh, of, of the opposite graph. So now I can enlarge it. And highlight it. So you see, uh, the concept of the opposite uh, graph is very easy. Basically, what you do, you reverse the direction of the arrows, all right? So, so uh, the beginning is now equal to the end, and the end is equal to the beginning. This is exactly what is given by these formulas. All right, and you can view uh, the extended graph. Now you can very easily view it as um, the union of the graph with its opposite graph over the set of vertices. Okay, so basically, uh, what what you are you are doing. Uh, uh, you take uh, the set of vertices is the same in the opposite graph and in the graph. So when you take the set vertical union of the set of vertices, just the same set of vertices. But now uh, the set of edges uh, in the opposite graph and the set of edges in the graph are disjoint. So take the disjoint union of them. So this is precisely as you, you have it over here. Right? And uh, in this way, you can view, and, and that's very important for me, you can view both E and uh, the opposite as subgraphs of the extended graph. <laughs> Which simply means that the set of vertices uh, of E and the set of vertices of E op, which is the same, is the subset of the set of vertices of E bar, which is the same. And uh, the same inclusion is with the edges, but mo most importantly, if you look at uh, 
uh, the source and the target map in the extended graph and you restrict it to E, that's just the source and target map in E. And when you look at the source and target map in E bar and restrict it to E op, then again, it's just a source target map in E op. Okay, that's just by, by the very definition. Uh, there is nothing strange about it. You just uh, look at these formulas. Okay, so now I want to take this point of view that E and E op are subgraphs of my extended graph. And now, <laughs> I can move uh, further and uh, ask the question, when, when I have a morphism from one graph to another, I mean, being a subgraph is, is an injective morphism from one graph to another, uh, when does it induce uh, a map on path algebras? Okay, so that's uh, what I want to do next. And there is a beautiful proposition. Now, first, first I want to look at uh, graph homomorphisms because that's very important. So I'm doing it for the benefit of the newcomers. So for Niklas, it's obvious because he attended in the previous semester. But people who didn't attend my uh, lectures in the previous semesters might be a little bit confused. That's why I make this total recall. See, I'm using a special editing app so that I can write on, oh yes, 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 we've got it on my PDF file, but I'm not so good at navigating at it yet. <laughs> All right, so first uh, we want to know what the homomorphism of a graph from a graph to a graph is, okay? So that's the most obvious thing you can think about. Uh, you have two set theoretical maps from E0 to F0, so from, from vertices to vertices and from edges to edges. And they have to respect the ends and the beginnings. Okay, so this is this is the most obvious definition you can possibly fathom. Okay? There's there's is, is no brainer. Okay, however, this turns out to be too restricted. That's why uh, uh, we introduced the following thing: a path homomorphism of graphs. Okay, so now that's a little bit more involved. Uh, so this is given by one set theoretical map which goes from uh, all finite paths in E to finite paths in F, all right? But we have a number of assumptions. So first, the vertices might remain vertices. You cannot turn the vertex into a path of length 20. And then of course, you must have the usual um, respect, uh, the usual conditions for respecting the structure. So the ends and the beginnings of paths must match. So these, these are these commutation relations between F and uh, source maps and F and target maps. And then you have a, a relation sort of which makes a, F a functor if you think about graphs as small categories, okay? So in other words, uh, the, the, this uh, set theoretical map from finite paths in E into finite paths in E must be compatible with concatenation of paths, right? So which is exactly this condition. So that's what we mean by a path homomorphism, all right? So this is more general because in particular, I, I, I can have a graph and I can map uh, an edge into a path of length million. That's okay. As long as the end and uh, the beginning will match accordingly. Good. Now um, we have to move into much further into path algebras uh, where we discuss for which what are the conditions on path graph homomorphisms or path homomorphisms of graphs? So that they induced as, as, as in a covariant functor, a map from path algebra of one graph to, to the path algebra of the other. And uh, these are very simple conditions. And I want to find this uh, proposition. So this is somewhere in path algebras. So that's already in section two. Yeah, path algebras. The definition of path algebra. Examples of path algebras. Structure of path algebras. Radicals. I think it's 226.
Yes. Okay. So that's the proposition 226. And uh, you see, I have, so, so this I, I, IPG uh, stands for TAF homomorphisms of graphs, which is injective on vertices. Okay, so remember, uh, just if we take a, a general path homomorphism of graphs, uh, we only assume that vertices are mapped into vertices, but they can be, we don't say that they are not glued. Okay, I can map all vertices into one vertex. So when it's IPG, so it's injective path homomorphism of graphs. Okay, so this is what this IPG stands for. And then, well, that's the beauty. You see, uh, when, when you have such a path homomorphism of graphs, then it induces functorially a homomorphism of respective path algebras. And here's the formula. That's a completely obvious formula. And of course, it's, it's, it's well defined at the level of vector spaces. Uh, because uh, a chi labeled by a path uh, gives you, by definition, by construction, a basis, the canonical basis of a path algebra. Okay, so uh, F star is obviously a linear map, and uh, well, P is a path, so F of P is a path, but in the other graph, so it all makes sense. And then you have to prove then under under this one mild assumption that F is injective on vertices, uh, this is indeed a homomorphism of algebras. So that's what we proved before, okay? And, and uh, of course, we don't need it to just draw a simple conclusion for one of our two, our two corollaries uh, that we currently discuss, but I want you to have this bigger picture, okay? And that, that's the bigger picture that in, in complete generality, we have this covariant functor from graphs to path algebras uh, which is well defined as long as the, the category of graphs that you take uh, has as morphisms of these elements in IPG, so injective path homomorphisms of graphs. Then it works, and you see this is what we proved, we calculated, which was a little bit of work. I mean, you see that's not immediate. Uh, it's easy, but it's not immediate. Okay. Uh, so now, in, in particular, in particular, uh, when you look at E as a subgraph of F, you can look at this inclusion as, 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 a, as an element in IPG, right? It's actually far more restrictive, but in particular, because you have an inclusion, you are injective on vertices. And of course, uh, every graph homomorphism is a path graph homomorphism because you map um, edges to edges and everything works. Uh, it's just a special case, all right? So, so when I have the inclusion of, of graphs, then by this proposition 226, okay, I can uh, say that uh, then I have also, in fact, it's also an inclusion of path algebras. And the fact that this is an inclusion uh, follows from this definition of F star. So this is why it's, it's good to see it because you map basis elements to basis elements, right? And because you cannot, um, uh, how does it prove that this is injective? Uh, let me see. No, I mean the whole, if you have inclusion of, of, of graphs, then, then obviously um, every path in E is a path in F and, and then this map over here is just an inclusion, right? And when, when F is, is an inclusion uh, on the set of all finite paths, then of course, uh, here you map injectively basis elements into basis elements. So, so, so this means that uh, this is also an injective star, an injective homomorphism of algebra, all right? So, so that's uh, why I wanted you to see these formulas over here. And now I can go back to our lecture where we stopped. And from the main theorem, the basis theorem for relative compact algebras, I can now uh, draw some pretty trivial conclusions, but I think they are uh, worthwhile. So you see, so, so this is our main theorem where we uh, show what a linear basis is for relative compact algebras which includes in particular Levit path algebras, which is very important for us. 
So basically, you have all these uh, elements of the form uh, chi alpha beta star, but you have to remove some elements from there. Okay. So where are these curves? Okay. So so this is this is where we are uh, right now. I I want uh, us to look at corollary two point thirty six. Uh, and remember, we looked at this proposition uh, 226, um, which told us when we have a covariant functor from the category of graphs to the category of, or a category of graphs to the category of path algebras. Um, uh, I explained to you in what sense I view E and E op as subgraphs of the extended graph, okay? And we just discussed that uh, subgraphs always use inclusions of path algebras of these graphs. Uh, so we now have the inclusion of uh, uh, path algebras, two, two of them, in fact. Uh, Ke is a subalgebra of Ke bar, and Ke op is a subalgebra of Ke bar. All right. But now, when you look at how basis elements uh, look like uh, for relative concave algebra, you can conclude that for any graph and for any subset X of regular vertices in E and for any field K, when you take the canonical quotient map, uh, which which maps uh, the path algebra into this relative concave algebra. Once you restrict it to Ke or Ke op, then it is injective. Okay. And uh, well, why why is it the case? Uh, first, have a look at the elements uh, that we take away. Right. They are very special elements. And in particular, they, they all require that, you, you, that the path with which you label your chi is not in E or E op. It's a mixture. You have an edge from, from E and you have an edge from E op. All right? Otherwise, this doesn't make sense. So Fxv and Fxv bar. So, 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 so one edge is in E and, and this start edge is in E op. OK? So uh, obviously, this is not in the image of a canonical quotient map restricted to Ke or Ke op. So we are not removing anything, right? And then, uh, uh, then, then when you look at, at uh, these um, uh, basis elements uh, of the form chi p, where p is a path uh, in E, uh, then this canonical quotient map does, does, does nothing. I mean, you could just take appropriate class uh, of uh, this chi p now in this relative con path algebra. And this is a basis element over there. So again, you just map injectively uh, basis elements to basis elements. So this restriction of the canonical cost map is an injection. And exactly the same reasoning for the opposite graph. Again, because uh, if you have chi with labeled by a path, which is solely in uh, the opposite uh, a graph, then it's not taken away from here, right? So, so this means that when I take chi p when p is now in, in, in a path in the opposite graph, uh, then the canonical quotient map uh, will map it into a basis element in uh, the relative uh, con path algebra. And again, since you map injectively basis path elements, basis path elements, you have an injection. So, so this, this is a very nice uh, corollary. Uh, and, and the lesson is, is very simple, that no matter how complicated your relative concave algebra is, so no matter what is your set of regular vertices, what the subset X you use, as long as you stay within chi alpha or chi beta star, then these guys are always linearly independent, okay? In the relative con algebra, no matter how complicated your X is, all right? Sometimes it might be useful when you just look at an example and you want to see what it really is. So these guys are immediately linear independent. What you have to worry about is when you mix chi alpha and chi beta star. All right. And uh, now uh, our next step, that is what uh, we want to show today. This is the focus of um, our today's lecture, uh, is to show that in fact, and let me highlight it and then I switch into my whiteboard. We want to show that uh, if you take any X relative concave algebra of any graph E and access any subset of a regular vertices of E, then in fact, 
uh, it is the Levy of algebra of a modified graph EX, which we are going to elaborate. Okay, this is quite elaborate, but it's, it's very nice. And this is important in the theory of graph sister algebra. This is why I, I want to do it so carefully. Okay, so now I stop sharing. All right, this is good. I have to somehow queue this browser. Okay, and now I start sharing and I use my whiteboard and I share. I move it into my main screen. Okay, full screen. Okay, this should work. So now we're going to define this graph EX, but it will take a while. So this is why I want you to know up in front, why are we bothering with such a complicated definition? Because at the end of the day, we will have this very beautiful theorem that uh, the, the Levitt path algebra of EX is isomorphic to the relative concave algebra given by X. And this is astonishing that it's possible. And we have a very simple example of a phenomenon concerning the Tepfis path algebra, uh, Tepfis algebra. And I hope Maciek will show us in the recitation class uh, a proof. This will be like a baby proof for the theorem which we have to do in full generality. Okay, but let's first unravel the mystery of what on earth is this graph EX. Uh, so E is any graph. E any graph. X, any subset of a set of regular vertices of E, Don, touching something and, ah, I know. So here the trick is uh, that, that you cannot go too high up. Somehow the, the, the top uh, five millimeters of the whiteboard uh, reacts uh, by shrinking or whatever when you touch them. So I have to remember not to go too high up. Okay, and uh, we have to introduce uh, some notation. So th th this is given data, a graph uh, X, a, a graph E and the set X or A set X, a subset of uh, regular vertices. So this is given. Now we define uh, the following set Y. Sorry, I don't know if it's me, but I do not see anything on the... Oh. Maybe that just me. You don't see the whiteboard? We see the whiteboard, but we don't see anything written. Yeah, 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 sorry. But it's strange because we see it written. It's... <laughs> this is very strange. So, so wait, now when I write, can you see what I write, the zigzag and so on? No. No. Okay, so the only, the only idea I have is that I, I stop sharing and start again. But that's strange because here it works. Uh, share, okay. Stop share. Now share screen. And whiteboard, share. Okay, can you see the whiteboard now? Yes. Yes. And can you see my writing on this whiteboard? Yes. Yes. Oh, so that's Zoom. But I cannot even blame Impan for this. <laughs> Let's zoom. Okay, so first let me erase my zigzags. Right. Go back to my pen. So Y is defined as a complement of X in a regular vertices. So take all right ah, again I touched. Take all regular vertices of E but subtract x. See, in other words, y is the set of all regular vertices in E that are not in x. So this is, this is very important. Uh, and now haha, we define f in the following funny way. So now we are looking at all edges that end in y. 
All right, so let me write it down like this. This is a set union over a V running Y. And here I take my target map in my graph E and I take its pre-image of a vertex V and I take the union. So in other words, F are all edges that end in Y, okay? And again, this is, this is uh, by definition, it's not an input data. Input data is E and X. Y and F are derived from my input data. Now we do the following trick. This is very important. Next, let Y prime and F prime be disjoint copies. of y and f respectively. So in other words, I double all vertices in uh, y and I double all edges in f, okay? Now to make it a graph, I still have to tell you what, 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 what is uh, uh, the source and the target of these doubled edges. And then I hopefully have a new graph, okay? So now we can define a new graph EX. Uh, by the following formulas. So first I have to tell you what are my uh, vertices and what are my edges. So as I already mentioned, I'm, I'm simply doubling uh, vertices in Y. So if you want E X zero is just E zero and then set vertical union with Y prime. And when I look at the edges, so E X one, these are all edges in E one, set vertical union with F prime, okay? So, okay, this is prime, this is one, it's a bit confusing. <laughs> so this is one and this is prime. And of course, a Y prime uh, is disjoint with E zero and F prime is disjoint with E one by definition, by construction. I said that they're disjoint copies, okay? And now I, of course, have to tell you what is the source and, and the target map. And this is a little bit tricky to write down. I will write it down in the following way. So first about the source map. So what is the source map in EX? I apologize, it looks like sex, but I have no way to avoid it. Uh, I think it's the same or similar in the book. Uh, of E, well, that's by definition, just S, E. So normally the source and target maps are not labeled when you just have one graph you're talking about. But when you simultaneously talk two different graphs as I'm doing right now, you must distinguish. This is absolutely necessary, okay? And sometimes you also have the following issue that you have this canonical extension of source and target maps from edges into finite paths. And sometimes again, when you take pre-images, you have to distinguish which map you actually need. But here we, we don't care. Here we, we are not taking pre-images uh, in this non-obvious way, okay? <laughs> All right, so, so I have SEX of E. This is just SE uh, of E, provided that my E is in E1. So in this part of e, EX1, and uh, when I look at E prime, so, so, so the guy which is in F prime, so S E X of E prime, then guess what? I'm taking it, it by definition to be the beginning, but of the edge E. So in other words, E prime begins exactly at the same place as E, right? They have the same starting point. But now we can guess that it will be more fun with, with a, a target map because they will end at a different point. So for E in F, or if you want for E prime in F prime, whatever, the same thing, yeah? So now I, I, I because E1 e and uh, F prime are these joint sets, this is well defined. 
and now the, the, the target is almost identical with one but that I'll put a prime here. So now I have text. You can see now we're going to look like tech. E. This is just T E of E or E in E1. And uh, if I look, sorry, this is capital of E prime. Well, of course, when I take TE, I cannot apply to anything prime because this is a, this is a target map in the graph E, not EX, okay? But I can strip my E prime of a prime and apply it to E. But now, by the very definition of what it means that E prime is in F prime, it means that E is in F. And when E is in F, its end is in Y. And if its end is in Y, I can put a prime here. Okay, so, so this prime is what, what makes it work. <laughs> okay, so, so, so I, I will do examples in, in just a second, but, but basically uh, what we do is uh, the following. We have a vertex uh, V here and, and imagine that this is a vertex at which something happens and uh, we have an edge which goes here, so sorry, VW. And so imagine that W is, uh, is something at which uh, things happen. So w, w is in Y. So let's assume that W is in Y. So then we have W prime, which is a distinct vertex. And then we must have E prime. But E prime starts at the same place as E, which is V. But it must end because of this prime and W prime. OK? So that's, that's a basic recipe. OK? Now let me, yeah, actually, I can keep it. All right, and now we have to do some work. Uh, I have a whole number of elementary facts to prove. And let's do them one by one. So whenever I introduce a new concept, I first do elementary facts about this new concept. I mean, sort of proposition that you can prove in a cafe on a napkin. Uh, and then do examples, okay? So that's basically what we should still do in the remaining uh, 50 minutes of the lecture. Okay, so first elementary fact is that E is a subgraph of EX. Right, that's obvious by construction, right? Because E0 is a subset of E0x, uh, E1, E1 is, a, is a subset of E1x. So here you have subsets. And when you restrict, when you restrict your edge uh, to E1, the source map uh, in EX is the restriction, uh, the source map is, uh, in E is the restriction of the source map in EX and likewise uh, with uh, the target map, okay? So this is, these are, this is really a subgraph. E is a subgraph of EX. And also you can immediately see from the definition that if you take your X uh, to be everything, then Y must be empty, right? If X is all regular vertices, yeah, if X is all regular vertices, then Y must be empty. And then Y is empty, then Y prime is empty. And also F is empty. So F prime is empty. So this means that uh, E0 is equal to E0x and uh, uh, E1 is equal to E1x. So the next uh, thing that I want to write is that E reg E is just equal to E. So no changes whatsoever, which is obvious because, because Levit-Pav algebra is exactly the relative cone algebra for X equal to regular vertices in E. So of course, but then, then this fancy isomorphism which I'm going to construct for you in a theorem to come is just an identity map, the identity map. <laughs> okay, so that's really, really elementary. Uh, now some finiteness properties. Okay, so easier, so for starters, easier is finite. If and only if the x is zero is finite. 
And I guess it's obvious, right? Because, uh, well, for starters, uh, any subset of a finite set is finite. So one way implication is trivial. But now let's assume that uh, E0 is finite, okay? When, when E0 is finite, I choose in E0 some subset Y. So it also must be finite. I take this disjoint copy Y prime, but it's finite. The sum of finite set is finite, okay? So you have this if and only if, right? And this is important for unitality. Remember that uh, uh, the path algebras and the relative con uh, path algebras are unital if and only if uh, the, the number of vertices in a graph is finite, okay? So, so in other words, uh, if you take a path algebra or con path algebra, or whatever, of, of graph E, then it will be the same, it will be unital at the same time when um, this uh, modified graph path algebra or con path algebra is unital, okay? Or Levit, whatever. So sort of unitality is uh, not, is preserved by this, if you want X deformation of, of uh, E. I, I look, I already mentioned it. Uh, I look at this uh, choice of X as a kind of between inverted commas homotopy. It's a homotopy uh, from the absolute con path algebra to the Levit path algebra. If X is empty, then this is just absolute con path algebra. When X is all regular vertices, then this is the Levit path algebra. It really helps to explore these things in between, improving some theorems as far as I remember. Okay, but that's not it. And uh, likewise, uh, you can have the same claim about E1. So I can write it like this. So the set of, of edges in E1 is uh, finite if, if the set of edges in uh, EX uh, is finite. One way, again, it's obvious because E is a subgraph of EX, but how about the other implications? So assume that E has finitely many edges. Why is it true that EX has finitely many edges? Well, just go back uh, to this definition. And the only thing that you have to see is that uh, F prime is a finite set. And uh, well, now Y can be infinite because I didn't assume that uh, you have finitely many you have finitely many uh, vertices and why now is it the case that um, finiteness of uh, e1 ah okay i suppose uh, i suppose still okay fine uh, even if, if I if, even if i have infinitely many elements uh, in y which is allowed Right. Remember that F is still a subset of E1. So F must be a finite subset, no matter what. I mean, uh, you, you can have an infinite sum, but it will have just keep on intersecting with. Uh, so F, F is finite because it's a subset of a finite set. And then when you double a finite set, it's a finite set. So you have a union of two finite sets, so it's fine. Okay. Okay. Um, maybe I shouldn't say anything about intersecting, but anyway, this uh, finiteness is handled like this. Okay, let's not uh, linger on this anymore. And now there is something which is uh, slightly more uh, interesting and very, very important. I didn't find it written this way in a book. And here I believe that formulas are more speaking to one than words. So let me do these little trivial formulas which are not in the book of Levit path algebras. And I think this allows you to draw conclusions in a very nice, nice way. So this is a point in which you say that E is all finite. if and only if the x is row finite. That's our third elementary fact. But, in, but, in, but we will argue for this uh, in a way that uh, is actually very handy also for other claims, okay? So, so if, for starters, uh, one-way implication is trivial, right? Ah, a row finite, just in case you don't remember, the row finite means that there are no infinite emitters, okay? That, that uh, every vertex is either a sink, so it emits nothing, or it, it emits finitely many different edges. So this means row finite, okay? 
So for starters, uh, if, if uh, EX is rule finite, trivial implies E rule finite. Because E in EX is a subgraph. Right? So, so, so in other words, uh, if I take any vertex in V uh, and, and, I, and I look uh, at, at edges it emits, all right? And if it, if it were no row finite, it would emit infinitely many edges, then of course these edges would be also in EX and this vertex would be also in EX. Uh, so then EX wouldn't be row finite. Okay, so, so, in, so in, in other words, what is obvious is that if E is not row finite, then EX is not row finite. So reversing the implication we have it. If EX is row finite, then E is row finite. So now the fun part is to prove the other implication. So to prove that if E is row finite, then EX is also row finite. So the ambient graph. By the way, it's constructed this row finite. So that's uh, the fun part. That's why I write moreover, because it's a more important argument. As you have the following uh, estimate, which is due to the very definition of uh, the graph EX. And, and I'm doing it in the following way. So here, this um, source and target maps are. Uh, dealt with as maps on the set of edges, not the set of apps, okay? So I look at the number of elements. I take my SEX, I take the pre-image uh, of a vertex V, is just any vertex whatsoever, okay? I take, so I take, in other words, I take all edges in EX that start in V, all right? But then I restrict uh, myself only to edges that are in a prime. Okay, so I intersect it. And uh, of course, this is uh, less or equal than the number of edges. And I'll explain it in a second that I have emitted from V in EX but now intersected with E1. And you might wonder, why, 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 why on earth? That's because of this uh, uh, doubling property. If you look at the construction of a graph, I take my, my vertex V and uh, it emits some edges, maybe none, maybe some. And if you have any edge that ends in Y, then at, from the same vertex, you also emit an edge uh, which ends in y prime, okay? But, 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 but if you have anything which ends in y prime, then of course you must have something which ends in y. But you might also have some other vertices that do not, uh, sorry, edges that do not end in y. That's why you have this inequality, okay? So this is directly by construction of the graph E, okay? <laughs> but now, uh, of course, I can, I can write it like this. And uh, it will be zero for V in Y prime. Because remember, uh, uh, Y prime is the set of doubled uh, vertices and nothing begins at these elements and only some things end. So, so all elements in Y prime are things by construction, right? Because everything in X begins uh, uh, begins, there's no prime here. You see S, E, E, S, E, there's no prime. So nothing begins at uh, a vertex in Y prime. So if V is Y prime, that's just zero because this set is empty as, as uh, the pre-image uh, of uh, S, E, X, O, V, this is zero. And, and otherwise, when you are not in Y prime, so which means that you are in E zero, and remember E X zero is just the disjoint union of these two sets. Well, I claim that what you have is just the pre-image of a map S E of the same vertex V, right? That, that, that's, that's clear because 
Now vertex V is in E0, okay? So you take all edges that start uh, at, at V. So of course you will have some edges that are in E and you have some edges which are beyond E. But because I restrict myself to edges that are in E1, well, basically I'm taking the pre-image uh, of a map as E in my graph uh, E of the vertex V, right? Because I, I restrict myself only to edges emitted from V which are in E1, okay? So this is, this is just this number as uh, the pre-image of uh, uh, S E of the vertex V, and I take, uh, I count how many elements I have. Okay, so this is just by construction. And so from this, you can, you can infer the following, and you have it for any, so let me now write it down. This is true for any V in E X zero. From this, you can infer that The following calls. I take my image of SEX of V. And uh, now I can write it as a sum. Of course, remember that here we might have infinities, but you have obvious rules for adding infinities. Um, so I just partition this set into two parts, these joint parts. I take the pre image of V intersected with f prime and when i take the complement so this is pre-image of sex of v intersected with e1 okay because ex1 is the disjoint union of f prime and e1 all right uh, so the union of these two sets is just s uh, ex pre-image of v and because we have this joint set, you have this addition of numbers. Okay, but now uh, you can write the following estimate that this is less or equal than, and well, if your V is in Y prime, then that's it. This is just zero. Okay, because because this uh, this is an empty set. S E X pre image of V. If V is in Y prime, this is just zero. So this is zero for V in Y prime, okay? But now because we just established that this number on the left is less or equal to this number on the right, I can simply write down twice the number of on the right in my estimate, okay? So, so uh, but then when I take this uh, V in E zero, of course this number on, on the right is just uh, the pre-image of SE of V. So it's twice the number of elements in the pre-image of SE of V, okay? So that's, this is a very, very important estimate that the number of elements in uh, uh, the pre-image of uh, SEX is less than equal to twice the number of elements in the pre-image of SE of the same vertex, as long as the vertex in E0, because otherwise this uh, SE cannot be, you cannot take the pre-image. Well, actually maybe you can because, because uh, yeah, well, if you are really precise, then SE doesn't land in, in EX0, uh, X lands in, in e, so, sorry, the, do, the domain of, of SE is not in EX1, so. No, sorry, this is about the, 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 the target. Uh, I have SE goes from E1 to E0. And now this is a subset in EX1. And here I have SEX and X0. And this is a subset. So, so somehow when I look at this map, I, I better stick to a vertex which is in E0. That's just bookkeeping. Okay, so, so, so now, and again, we infer it for any vertex V in EX zero. That's because here we have the states, right? Um, so hence, from this, estimate, the reverse implication is also true.
<laughs> Why? Well, uh, remember, uh, what is the reverse implication? We want to prove that if E is rho finite, then EX is rho finite. So in other words, we want to prove that if EX is not rho finite, then E is not rho finite. So assume that EX is not rho finite. That it means that we have some vertex V, which is an infinite emitter. Okay. Uh, well, but if I have some vertex uh, V, uh, which is an, an infinite uh, emitter, well, then it cannot be in Y prime because it's a sink. So it must be in E zero. So, so we are in this uh, second line. And uh, uh, then uh, we have that uh, what we have on the left hand side of this estimate is infinite. But then, of course, what is on the right hand side must also be infinite. <laughs> so this means that uh, V is also an infinite emitter when you look at it as a vertex in E. So, so then E is also not real fine. Okay. So this was much more fun than the previous elementary facts. Uh, but we go on. Um, what is number four? Well, we already mentioned it many times, but let's write it now. So all uh, for starters, all elements of Y prime are sinks. But slightly less uh, trivially, and any vertex uh, and any vertex v in E zero is a sink in E if and only if it is a sink in E x. All right. So, so that, that's that's the, the new addition. Uh, well, why? Let me spell it out. So V is a sink in the X. Obviously, implies that V is a sink. in E, because E is a subgraph of VX, right? That's the trivial part. <laughs> okay, uh, right, because if, 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 if uh, you have no edges from EX ending in V, then of course you don't have edges from E ending in V. So we have this implication holding trivially. And now, if V is a sink in E, so we are reversing this implication. You have this implication when V is a sink in the X, but not for free by uh, the foregoing formula. So in the notes, I just have a number, which is say two nine. So you see, that's precisely by this estimate. So we used this estimate before just to handle uh, infinities, but now we can also handle zero, okay? So, so uh, what we want to say, I, I have that V is a sink in E, okay? So this, this means that uh, this number over here is uh, zero, it emits no edges. So twice zero is zero. And by this estimates also there are no edges uh, in the X that are emitted from V, okay? So, so but we use this uh, estimate here, okay? And now we combine the preceding two elementary facts to conclude that the set of regular vertices in E is the same as the set of regular vertices in X. This is beautiful. So combining the two preceding elementary facts, we conclude that 
and the set of regular vertices in E is the same as the set of regular vertices in X. And this is really nice. That's what we really want. Okay, how do we uh, argue? So for starters, Uh, because uh, all elements of y prime are things, so they cannot be regular vertices. We have that regular vertices in E x are in fact contained in E zero. Okay, so that's that's the trivial observation. But now uh, let's uh, write, let's use this uh, estimate we already have in, in a more fancy way. Uh, moreover, we have the following double inequality for any V in E0, okay? For any V in E0. We have that the number of elements in the preimage of V under SE is, of course, less than equal than the preimage of SEX in the same vertex. So, this is just because uh, E is a subgraph of EX. And now we have this estimate that we already looked at. This is twice SE inverse of V. Okay. <laughs> So because E is a subgraph of the X, so that's this inequality. And by the previous formula. Right, I mean, when I restrict myself just to uh, vertices in uh, zero, okay, then, then this is this estimate, okay? When I forget E prime, Y prime, that's this estimate. So this is wonderful because now I have this double estimate, okay? And uh, now I can make uh, this conclusion, right? So V belongs to, the set of regular vertices in E, if and only if it belongs to the set of regular vertices in EX. So for starters, uh, which since we are talking regular vertices uh, only, uh, we are talking only about vertices in E zero, Y prime is brushed aside. And, and this double inequality handles both uh, zero and um, infinity. So, so in other words, if a V is a sink in E, then this is zero, full time zero is zero. So also the S uh, EX image preimage is zero, uh, it's empty. So, so, so then V is a sink in EX. Um, of course, if V is a, a sink in EX, then this set is zero, it's empty. So this number is zero, but this means that the other number is zero which means that the other set is empty. So it's also a sink in V. So this is how you, you handle the sink part. <laughs> and now uh, if, if V uh, is an infinite emitter in E, then obviously it's an infinite emitter in EX. And also if V is infinite emitter in EX, then by this inequality, it must be an infinite emitter in E. So you have relief and only. But that's, this is a very beautiful double inequality. Which, which tells you a lot about the relationship between the graph C and the X, okay? <laughs> Great. So this was our elementary uh, fact number five. We have two more to go, and then we do examples. Now it's about sources. So sources are, if you want, opposite to things. So a source is a vertex which does not uh, receive an edge. It only emits edges, okay? So what's our claim? Elementary fact number six. If V E, if, if 
v in E0 is a source in E, then it is also a source in EX. Uh, why? Well, we, we are in uh, we are in E zero, okay. Uh, so I, I look well. Uh, so so the number of of uh, edges in E that end here is zero. So why is the number of, of edges uh, in E X then? And then so okay, I just have to look at at edges in uh, E prime. So that's that's obvious, but you have to um, have the definition of E X in your random access memory uh, to make heads and tails out of it. So let me go back to uh, this definition. <laughs> okay. I'm looking at the, at the vertex uh, V and I, I assume that it's a source in E, so no edge from E1 ends there, okay? So there is no E in E prime which ends there, in E1 which ends there. But uh, let me assume that, that there is an, an edge uh, in, in uh, F prime which ends there, but that's, that's impossible because every edge from E prime ends in Y prime. So that's not in E zero, okay? So, so this means if no edge from E1 ends there, then no edge from, from uh, e, e X1 ends there, okay? So this is why I can just write it freely. That's obvious. But then the other way around uh, implication is obvious because uh, uh, again, E is a subgraph of EX, okay? So, so I can write that v in e zero is a source in e if and only if it is a source in e x uh, again because because uh, because e is a subgraph of e x Right, so that's for, that's for the other implication. If I if if V is a source uh, in EX, this means that no edges from EX and there, so of course no edges from E and there. So it's also a source in in E. So the, the reverse implication is obvious. So this is why you have this if and only. Okay, so vertex in E zero is a source in E if and only if it's a source in EX. So very much as we had it for um, things, and then the final elementary facts is again, a bit more fun, it's about acyclicity. So I claim that E is acyclic, which means there are no loops. If and only if EX is acyclic. And that's not so immediately obvious, at least not to me. So let's, of course, it's trivial, these elementary facts, but uh, uh, you have to give some elementary arguments. So, uh, indeed, suppose that P is a loop. And P is some finite path of length bigger than zero. So I have edge E1, E2, up to En. <laughs> okay. And suppose that this is a loop in EX. Because again, uh, one implication will be, will be obvious. Uh, if, 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 there is a, if there is a loop uh, in E, uh, then there is a loop in EX because it's a subgraph. So if E is not a cyclic, then e, e, EX is not a cyclic. So if EX is a cyclic, then E is a cyclic. So, so the, the, the property of being a cyclic is hereditary. If you go to, to sub things, it uh, prevails. Okay, so now we, we do the, the interesting part, the other way around. So we take a loop in EX and we want to prove that it is in fact a loop in E. 
And that's not so completely obvious. Why is it a loop in E when it's a loop in X? Well, uh, the reason is, is, is the following. Well, it's a loop. Then it means that the end in the X of P is equal to the beginning in the X of P. Uh, but remember, the beginning of anything in P, in E, in the X is, is in E0. Everything that starts in the X starts at vertices in E0, okay? Y primes are things. So I can now write that this belongs to E0. Okay, uh, that's just because we have P as a loop, but this implies that the end of the last edge EN is in E0, right? Because the end of a path is the end of its last edge, but now that's the beginning of a path which must be in E0, okay? So TX of EN must be in E0. Okay, but hence EN must be in E1. Why? Uh, well, it, it's, it's uh, something that uh, begins, uh, okay, so, so it's something which ends in E0. And if it were not in E1, it would have to be in F prime. But if it were in F prime, it would have to end in Y prime. But Y prime is beyond E0. So that's the contradiction, okay? So, so this means that EN must be in, in, in E1. Uh, and, and of course, also we can immediately conclude that the end of a preceding edge, EN minus one, because now EN is in E1, then of course its beginning is in E0, right? So this means that the end of a, of a preceding uh, edge is, which is equal to the beginning of EN, S E X. This must be in E zero. Okay, and now I can iterate my reasoning. So iterating this reasoning. We conclude that the whole loop is in P. That the whole loop P is, sorry, is in E. Right, because iterating this reasoning, I, I, I can conclude that all the edges are in E, so the whole loop is in E. So in other words, uh, if uh, EX is not a cyclic, then E is not a cyclic. So in other words, if E is a cyclic, then also the ambient graph EX is a cyclic. So we have this uh, difficult uh, implication done. So let me just, for legal purposes, write that the reversed implication holds trivially because E is a subgraph of the X. Okay. So this ends a, my list of elementary facts. Have you got any questions about the elementary facts? They should be elementary, so we should have no questions, but uh, no? Alice Carr? Good. Good. So now we go to examples, right? We can do many examples and it's actually fun. Oh, I cannot even write examples. So the first is example which Maciek is going to use in the recitation class. So I take my X, 
I, I, I found a, a joke on a TikTok. Uh, uh, can you replace my X without asking why? <laughs> Very much relevant to the notation that, that we have here. Sorry about this. Um, uh, okay, so let let X uh, be uh, let X uh, be empty. So that's good enough for any graph, and I want my graph E to be just one loop graph. So I have my vertex V and I have my loop, simple loop, short loop E. <laughs> okay. So then, what is uh, E X? Well, for starters. Then why? Look, uh, the set of regular vertices is just uh, one element set containing V. This is a regular vertex. When I subtract the empty set, it's still the same one. So this is V. <coughs> uh, and, and now, um, when you look at F, so, so the edges that you, you double, remember, you take all edges that end in Y, which is E, and you double. So then F, is equal to one element set containing the loop E, all right? So consequently, right, like this. we can conclude that EX is the Tepley's graph. So I first draw my subgraph. I have my V and I have my E. Well, uh, v is in y, so I have to have my v prime. I double y. And then I double uh, f. So I must have e prime. Well, e prime must begin at the same vertex as e, which is v, but it's, it must end in the prime of v, which is v prime. So that's e prime. Okay. And now, what Maciek will show in the recitation class is that the absolute cone path algebra of E is equal to the Levit path algebra of EX. And that's, this is fun. This is really crazy. Because, because when you look at the absolute cone path algebra of E, we know that this is exactly uh, the Tepley's algebra on the nose by construction or if you want by Coburn theorems. But uh, here, that's something completely weird. And, and you take the Levit path algebra, it has many relations, more generated. Lo and behold, it's the same thing. Yeah. This allows us to, 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 to view the, the, Tepitz path, the Tepitz algebra, the famous Tepitz sister algebra as, as a graph sister algebra for this graph. That's why this is called the Tepitz graph. Okay, another example. Uh, well, this is what should remind you of matrix algebras. So let E be just a graph consisting of a simple path, V1, V2, dot, 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 and then you end in the end. So you have N uh, vertices and N minus one edges, okay? Aligned into a simple path. So the graph sister algebra of this is just a matrix algebra of size N minus one. Sorry, of size n. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I want to be a little bit more fancy with my x. So I define my x. So now, what is the set of uh, regular vertices in E? So these are all vertices except for the last one, which is a sink. Okay. And now I don't want x to, to be everything. So I delete just the first vertex, v1. So this is the set from v2 to the n minus one. Okay, that's my x. So then y is just a one element set consisting of v1 because that's the only regular vertex which is not in x. And f is empty because the, the v1 is a source. So there is no, no uh, edge which ends in v1, so there is nothing to double. I know I just to double, okay? 
variables. So basically what happened now is uh, that this EX is on one hand side, you have this graph E as you had before. So V1, V2, dot, 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 Vn, okay? So Vn minus one, why not? And now you just uh, have this additional uh, vertex V1 prime, isolated. Okay, that's it. Just add one more edge. So now if you would take uh, the relative cone path algebra of, of E, and somehow you would fail to impose the second type conspicuous relation at V1, then it would be exactly the Levit path algebra, but for this uh, modified graph EX, where you would have this additional dimension that comes into the algebra from this isolated vertex. So, so that's, I think, consistent with um, what we had before. And uh, now the, the next thing is, is, is this theorem I told you about, that the Levit path algebra uh, of EX is isomorphic with the Levit, with the con path algebra, X relative con algebra of E. Uh, but I, I think it doesn't make sense in the six minutes to even state the theorem. So instead, why don't we do, why don't we improvise and do one more example? This, this example is in the book and I kind of like it. So it's not the Teplitz graph because I reverse the arrow. So I have an edge and at the end of the edge, I have a loop. So let it be V, W, E, F. So this is my E. And all vertices here are regular. And uh, let me take X to be empty, all right? So what is E, X? So then for starters, uh, y is just uh, equal to E0. So this is my V and W. Okay, when I look at all edges that end in W, well, again, they are, they are both, right? E and F, both of them end in W. So also F is equal to the whole E1, which is E and F. Okay. So this EX is going to be fun. So first I draw my graph, E, W, E, which is now a subgraph, F. And I have two double vertices. So I have V prime and I have W prime. And I have two double edges, right? So F, uh, F so let me write Y prime is V prime, W prime, and F prime, it's E prime and F prime. Okay, so E prime must begin in V and must end in W prime. So this is my E prime. Now F prime must begin where F begins, which is W, but must end in W prime. So this is my F prime and that's it. And the V prime is an isolated vertex. Why? Because V is a source. So sources uh, in Y are mapped into isolated vertices in uh, uh, EX, okay? Because uh, they are sinks by, by the very construction and uh, nothing can end there because nothing ended there in E. So that's it. I, 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 I think that this is a, a, a good time to stop. Maybe, maybe just to advertise this uh, main theorem, how that is that the X relative on path algebra of E is isomorphic with the Levit path algebra of the X or S K algebra. And, but I want to be more specific. I want to make it as part of a statement of the theorem as to uh, how these maps are defined. And uh, the way we're going to prove it is uh, by constructing maps in both directions and doing both of our algebras 
as the universal algebras given by generators and relations. This will allow us uh, simply to restrict ourselves to, to, to generators, which will be given by edges and vertices. And there will be some complicated relations and it's actually quite a long theorem. Even the book is like a two pages of print. So, so I'll do my best to, to do the proof uh, in, uh, in the next lecture in a week, but maybe I'll have to brush some things uh, under the carpet. <laughs> but I suppose for the time being, we can stop. So I stop recording. Where is this course? Okay. Stop recording.